Our first scripture reading, our Old Testament lesson this morning, comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1 through verse 34. The Day of Atonement. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body, he shall be girded with a linen sash, and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. And therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as they did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. And so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. And then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself, and for the people. The fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who released the goat as a scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp. 
the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. And they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their offal. And then he who burns them shall wash their clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of that month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as a priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes and the holy garments. And then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Our epistle reading this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9 beginning at verse 1 through verse 28. The earthly sanctuary. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine services and the earthly sanctuary. For a table was prepared for the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which there were the golden pot that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with food and drink, various washings and fleshly ordinances opposed on the time of reformation. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall be the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is only in force when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is still living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. 
And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better f sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all, the culmination of the ages to do away with the sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Our gospel reading this morning is Mark's gospel, beginning at chapter 15, verses 33 through 40. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, Lana Sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. And then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come down to take him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. And then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And so when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. And there were also women looking on from afar, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the lesser, and of Joseph and Salome who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Here ends our reading. Now last week, if you were here or listened on the radio or on Facebook, the topic of the sermon, as you might remember, centered on the theme of the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah. And when this congregation gathered seven days ago, Rosh Hashanah had just begun that Friday evening previous. And it concluded then that Sunday evening. Ten days from the beginning of Rosh Hashanah then leads into the highest holy day of Judaism, which begins tonight. Now some of you folks, when you heard about Rosh Hashanah last Sunday, you, you might be thought, I've heard of that, but I don't remember or I've never learned what it is. And so we examined about what Rosh Hashanah is and the, the festival of trumpets calling the people to repentance. Now, some of you were able to be here. Some of you were out of town. Some of you were not feeling well. And some of you can only come to church on occasion because of work or whatever other kinds of responsibilities you have. And some people only make it to church two times a year. And so those people sometimes are called the C and E Christians, Christmas and Easter. Now, for the Jews the way that the same kind of practice for the Jews is to call them YK Jews, meaning that they come only on Yom Kippur, since it is the highest holy day of the faith. It is the only worship service that many attend. And there are many even secular Jews who really don't practice their faith or who don't talk much about God in their lives, but they'll stay there. And it's more of a commitment than the C&E Christians because the services on Yom Kippur last for almost an entire day. Many people spend the entire day at the synagogue, worship and then kneels and rest and the cycle repeats itself. Now, if you remember, going backwards again, thinking about Rosh Hashanah, Rosh means head and Hashanah means of the year. So the festival is the head of the year. It is the start of the Jewish New Year, the beginning of a new calendar. 
And so also then we're going to examine more about what Yom Kippur means. And Yom means day, and Kippur means covering, the day of covering, the day of atonement. And so we think about these things and how they're connected to each other, how one comes and the next one comes quickly in the calendar. We remember last week that the Festival of Trumpets brings to mind to the people that that there's this idea in the tradition of Judaism that at the beginning of that new year that God writes your name in the book of life for another year. He includes your name to live another year. And we thought about that too, that uh, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, that we talk about you're having your name written in the book of life. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, if you were to look in an encyclopedia or to look online, uh, you'll find at least two entries then for what is Yom Kippur. Now, one of the occasions to the Yom Kippur was when Egypt, along with other Muslim countries, invaded Israel during the year 1973. The conflict did not end it continued on for a number of years until President Jimmy Carter uh, convened together uh, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Egyptian President uh, Anwar al-Sadat for the Camp David Accords. The second definition of Yom Kippur would be the one that we are thinking about today, the Day of Atonement. And so in the Day of Atonement, that idea is carried from Rosh Hashanah. In Rosh Hashanah, your name is written in the Book of Life, and then the Jews think on the Day of Atonement that your name is sealed in the book of life. And so we think of that this morning as the scriptures use this kind of language as well to talk about our salvation. Like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now to redeem something means to buy it back. One thing needs to be exchanged for the other. In Judaism, this redemption took place every day. The sacrifices happened in the temples daily. But there was one special sacrifice, the one that we heard at length in Leviticus chapter 16, with all its regulations, with all its details, on that one day during the year when the priest, the high priest would enter the, the Holy of Holies and make that great sacrifice. And how there wasn't just one animal that was sacrificed, but then there was the other animal, the goat, who the you know Aaron first put his hands on to transfer the sins of the people onto the goat, and the goat carried the sins out into the wilderness, taking them away from the nation. Now this notion of sacrifice is not unique to Christianity nor Judaism. All religions have just primarily understood this since the beginning of time. All religions have felt this need that to get something from God, we have to first give something to God. And so you know how the ancient religions, the pagan religions, how they would, how they would sacrifice to get the rain to fall or to make the sun shine, to give them good crops for the year. And the Old Testament understands this idea too, although it works in a little bit different way, but the same basic foundation is found there as well. There has to be a sacrifice for something wrong that was done, something missing. To get God to forgive you, you have to first show your penitence. And so we see right away in the scriptures, at the beginning, Adam and Eve, when they received knowledge, what did they do then in their nakedness but attempt to cover themselves? They attempt to cover themselves with fig leaves. But the leaves did not do a good enough job in covering them. And so what do we remember from the book of Genesis? That the Lord made uh, animal skins for them to cover them. See, right away, right from the beginning, something had to give its life for something else. The animal skins had to come from an animal. There was death right away from the beginning to cover over, to hide their sins. So here was the first sacrifice in the scriptures. Not too long afterwards, Cain and Abel, each one makes a sacrifice. Cain makes his sacrifice of horticulture, of agriculture, of growing. And Abel makes his sacrifice 
from his animals. And which one, of course, was pleasing to the Lord? It was Abel's sacrifice. Why? Because it was a sacrifice of blood. Something had to be given. Somebody's life had to be yielded to receive the forgiveness. Why must sacrifice come with the shedding of blood? Why have people always understood this since the beginning of time? Even if they know nothing about Christ, know nothing of God, the, the, uh, the Father of Israel. Why does it have to involve killing? And it has to involve all these factors because sacrifice must be sacrificial. Something big has to be forfeited. Something has to be of great worth that's given up in order for it to be truly penitential. Now, a rich person will give millions of dollars to rescue one of their children if they're like taken as a kidnapping or something like that. But the sacrifice of Jesus is much more than money. No amount of money could ever cover over all the sins of the world. If Jesus Christ would have come instead, instead of dying on the cross, if he had come into the temple instead and had taken all the animals and had taken all the temple treasury, it still would have been nothing to cover all the sins of all time. We think of the costliness of sacrifice again. From right from the beginning, as it goes, it's just all throughout the scriptures. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham and Sarah. What does God tell Abraham to do? But to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And we can only imagine the pain that Abraham felt as he was leading his son up the mountain. True sacrifice has to sting. And of course, the sacrifice of all sacrifices, as we heard read in our gospel reading this morning, as Mary saw her beloved son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, stricken and afflicted and abandoned by his own friends to make atonement for our transgressions. Many people understand the seriousness of sacrifice, but they just can't bring themselves to talk about it. And it is indeed graphic. It's messy. Some of you, when you uh, see a needle stuck into your arm, you about faint because you can't stand the pain or the sight of blood. But as Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 in our reading today reminds us, without the shedding of blood, there is no sacrifice for sin. Now, the, in the Old Testament, the people could at least remove themselves one step because they didn't have to sacrifice the animal themselves. When they would travel from far distances, they'd come to the temple and they would exchange their money. And then they could just buy an animal there for the priest to sacrifice. But Jesus' the sacrifice is much greater. You know, you think again of when he was young, just an infant actually, and his parents took him to the temple. And what did they bring or would purchase but two turtle doves to make a sacrifice? But your sins are much greater than two turtle doves could atone for. So why not? any other kind of sacrifice? Why could you not even sacrifice your life? Why couldn't you even go up on the cross yourself upon Calvary if you could somehow do it? If you could nail yourself upon the wooden beams, even that would not be a sacrifice sufficient for your sin. And the reason that it would not is because the sacrifices needed for sin are great. Because it's not only about your sin. But it's about the sins of all those who have come before you. And it's about the sins of all those who will come after you, whose sins have not even yet been committed. And so we see then the profundity of the need for sacrifice made by Christ alone from the Old Testament all the way into the New. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us about how the Old Testament sacrifices were simply a type or a shadow. They pointed to something greater. Even in the temples built by Solomon and later by Ezra and Nehemiah, the sacrifices that they offered each day still could not atone for sin. Not even Yom Kippur and all its grandeur, is even, is almost all the Jews gather in the synagogues that day, not even that can atone for the sins of the world. And so Christ, the perfect one, the darling of heaven, had to leave fellowship with his father, submit himself 
to the cares and concerns of this world to die on the cross because no offering made upon earth can atone for your sins. Because Christ's sacrifice and because sacrifices in general are so graphic, we talk about these things as if they were personified in and of themselves. We'll say things like, his blood is crying out for justice. Now we know that there isn't literal blood flowing somewhere and that you know, the, you're going to put your head down there and you're going to hear this blood talking. But we, you get the point, the seriousness of the matter. Just like in the beginning of the Bible, when Cain murdered Abel, the Lord said his blood is crying out from the ground for vengeance. We speak about the blood as so powerful and so awesome. Wonder-working power in the blood. Just as it is so terrifying to think about how gruesome the sacrifice can be, like we saw in the, in the Passion, the movie that Mel Gibson made, the, the utter pain and horror of it all. Yet at the same time, we rejoice in it. We find great comfort and strength. We find that through the sacrifice of Jesus' blood, that such great stains on your soul are covered over so that you can wear white robes, be dazzling white before the throne in heaven. Just as Adam and Eve needed to cover over their transgressions and the Lord God made garments for them out of animal skins, so Jesus Christ's death on the cross covers over your transgressions, covers over the nakedness and exposure of your sins. And the book of Revelation talks about this, talks about the shedding of blood and the, and the seals being opened and the saints standing before the throne of heaven, white robe, praising the Lord. And we sing about this even too in our music. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it as white as snow. Sometimes it can seem confusing. Why do we speak about these two things as being so interchangeable? The staining of blood makes us clean. Now normally when you think of a garment, your, your shirt or your blouse or whatever you're wearing, if you get blood on it, that ruins it, that you can't wear it anymore. But the scriptures speak about it in a way that it just covers over you instead. And it's, that it's, such a, it's hard to wrap your minds around it because it's so profound. It's one of those paradoxes in the scriptures, just like, or two things being true at the same time, like Jesus being a human, Jesus being God, you being a saint redeemed by God, you being a sinner lost in your sin. And it's another one of these great mysteries that we see in the scriptures, that by being stained in the blood of Jesus, that you are totally cleansed from all your transgressions. It's hard for the world to understand this. It's hard for ourselves, first of all, to wrap our minds around this concept of being stained yet clean. And we understand why the world has a terrible time fathoming this. Like you think of the early Christians when they were meeting together in their homes to uh, observe the Lord's Supper. What did the other people in the society accuse them of being? They were cannibals. They talked about eating the body of Christ, drinking the blood of Christ. And yes, that does sound kind of weird if you don't understand the whole story. And the same thing even in our own day and age, too. What do we talk about? You know, blood and, e and eating and drinking. We think of like vampires and Dracula. But it is a great mystery. It is costly. It's not just some little thing that, uh, you know, we speak some nice words and Jesus forgives us our sins. I remember asking somebody about that once. I said, why couldn't Jesus just forgive the sins of the world by just speaking the words and your sins would be forgiven? Because it has to come with a cost. There has to be justice. Just like in a court of law, uh, a person has to face the consequences. Because wrong has been done, something has to be done to balance the equation. And so it is the same with the shedding of blood for our sins. But because you know the story, it doesn't sound like something gross or something unpleasant in its ultimate sense. It is something that gives life. It is something that gives you assurance in your soul that when you come forward to receive the body and blood of Christ in this holy meal, that it is not something to be ashamed of, but something to rejoice in, to share in the, and be strengthened in your faith. That he came to earth 
for a specific reason, not just to speak some nice words, not to engage in some type of social program only to lift up those who are in need, as important as that is, but that Jesus Christ came to pay the ultimate price that none of you, none of us in all our sins could atone for. So praise be to God that he has covered your sins, that he has covered my sins, that he has covered the sins that I have not and you have not yet even committed, and that he covers your sins today and tomorrow just like he covers it all. You know, not even one day a week or one I- a week of a year like Yom Kippur, not even that is sufficient. It's only a type. It's only a vague shadow that points towards something greater. And so it is that we can celebrate our Yom Kippur each and every day because Jesus Christ has made that sacrifice. It's already done. We don't have to partake in the bloody grossness of it all. That's done. It's in the past. Jesus has already taken care of that. As the book of Hebrews says, once and for all. It's not an offering. We don't have to come bring a sacrifice up here each Sunday and offering it up as a burnt gift to the Lord. It's been done. And so now all you simply need is to believe and trust that he's done it for you, that he's buried your sins, that he's covered over your sins. They are seen and exposed no more.